as I've said before, she made an appearance at the request of the White House in which she gave her best understanding of the intelligence that had been provided to her. If Senator McCain and Senator Graham and others want to go after somebody, they should go after me. What's happened recently, since yesterday in particular, that uh, Obama has goofed up his own standing by to saying the wrong things in the wrong time, or should we say the right time, which may bring him out of the presidency even before a chance at a second inauguration. Because if Obama is in a Richard Nixon outgoing mode, as it may prove to be the case, if he continues to talk the way he's been talking for the past two days and be acting for the past two days, then we will go through a complete change in the, in the succession of the presidency. He has stated that uh, Rice was, uh, was, was not doing anything wrong in what she said in lying her head off. And he became enraged in the process of that press interview, that public interview, in that process, and began to say things which tended to be implicitly incriminating. And therefore, the White House today is in a state of disruption and uncertainty, and it looks as though we are headed, probably, nothing is certain in this situation, but probably he's on the way out. And what he's uh, involved in and what the, C uh, the CIA has stated about the Benghazi affair, the facts and the truth of it, could lead to a full scale, a full throated, shall we say, treatment by the Congress, which may re result probably, not necessarily certainly, because there's a lot at stake here for all parties, but probably we are seeing the back end of Obama which may not be, after all, the worst end to look at. What lies hidden in the Obama White House's cover-up of the second 9-11 attacks goes much further than petty partisan bickering. What is at stake in this president's ongoing cover-up of the international terrorist networks involved in the attack on the U.S. consulate in Libya goes beyond even him. It leads directly to the British-Saudi International Terrorist Network, of which Obama himself is an asset. An al-Qaeda-affiliated group reportedly carried out the attack. Its members were angry. The attack on the U.S. mission... The ongoing investigations could not only lead to an early resignation of Obama, as LaRouche indicated in last Friday's webcast, but they could also ultimately lead to the bankrupting of an imperial faction which has effectively hijacked both the Obama and Bush-Cheney presidencies for the last 12 years. Through both administrations, this faction has used terrorist networks protected and funded by the U.S. Anglo-Saudi nexus as assets to destabilize nations across the planet, including our own, creating the pretext for launching illegal wars, whose aim has been to slowly and steadily erode the power of sovereign nations and the laws that hold them together, thus bringing the planet to where we are today, at the eve of a third world war. The four Americans were killed in Benghazi on the... The actual course of events in Benghazi, the planning, the funding, the networks, the orders to stand down once the attack occurred, and the stubborn refusal by the White House to facilitate what is known standard procedure when a U.S. diplomat is killed, are all facts. They are or can be determined. What is not determined is whether or not there is the political will to follow this through, not for the sake of one's party, but in the interests of the United States as a sovereign nation and a leader in a community of sovereign nations, which is currently under attack. In this report, we will look at two possible outcomes from where we stand today. First, the real prospects of a bipartisan grouping in and around the U.S. Congress, which rises above party to defend the interests of the United States against foreign interests, even if those interests are represented by the president-elect. And second, the consequences if these investigations don't go all the way and die on the vine like other recent congressional investigations getting lost in partisan politics, allowing the violations of the U.S. Constitution to go unchecked, 
opening the door for an Obama-led full military engagement in the Middle East, which would, in a matter of weeks, bring us in direct confrontation with Russia and most likely China. The Allen investigation began after the FBI found that the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, retired General David Petraeus, was having an extramarital affair. Just in the last several hours, uh, General David Petraeus, the head of the CIA, uh, handed in his resignation. And ostensibly, it was over a, uh, an extramarital affair, uh, so the usual kind of soap opera excuse. But there's at least some indication uh, that this is tied to the fact that, uh, as Lynn put it, Petraeus has been the godfather of Obama's Nero policy of drone assassinations and that basically the CIA was being turned into not much more than a paramilitary adjunct to some of the special forces uh, units that are involved in basically running around the world carrying out assassinations. And when you've got changes as dramatic as those that are going on right now throughout the Islamic world with the Muslim Brotherhood government in Egypt and in Turkey and the Syria situation, Mali, all of these things going on, uh, the idea that somehow you're going to actually accomplish anything by drone assassinations is absolutely preposterous. So there was clearly, at least as far as we're getting preliminary indications, uh, a move against Petraeus. Uh, which, by extension, is a move against Obama. The Reuters news agency reported that an official email showed the White House and the State Department were advised hours after the assault that an Islamic militant group had claimed credit... The on September 11th Benghazi attack and its subsequent cover-up occurred as an inevitable symptom of what is now recognized as nearly a decade-long failed strategy in the war on terror. However, the failure is not a failure of our military operations as a whole. What has many members of the CIA, military and intelligence, particularly incensed, is what is known internally and abroad as the equivalent of a Global Phoenix program, where the CIA and other special operation units are given executive authority to assassinate heads of state and others suspected of terrorist affiliations without due process and without warning. This is typical of what U.S. counterterrorism became under people like Petraeus, the so-called godfather of the CIA's heavily criticized but still operating drone program. These paramilitary operations, which Obama has sole executive authority over, by their very nature, require the violation of U.S. constitutional and international law, as is typical of Obama's so-called Libya strategy since March of this year. Well, then again, and uh, when President Obama decided to go in and bomb Libya, uh, that again brought it to my mind, well, here we go again, here's an administration that has bypassed Congress, meaning bypassed the Constitution, which is more important than Congress, really. But the Constitution says that you will consult with Congress, you will ask for a declaration of war. And uh, to my knowledge, if he consulted with anyone at the time, it was just uh, one, two, or three people, maybe in the uh, leadership of the Republican and Democratic Party. So working with Bruce Fine, we put in HCON Resolution 107 that Jeff just mentioned. On September 21st, Representative Walter Jones, flanked by leading retired military, members of the intelligence community, and constitutional lawyers, held a press conference on Capitol Hill, representing one front of what we now know to be an expansive institutional core moving against the Tony Blair-authored Obama interventionist doctrine, which has shifted into high gear last March with the illegal invasion of Libya and the murder of Muammar Gaddafi. Expand beyond that. The most recent disclosures in the New York Times, not at all refuted by the Obama administration, they take pride in it, shows that the president claims and exercises authority to survey every species individual on the planet. If he says, you're in imminent danger to the United States, you get vaporized. Predator drone. Any judicial review? No. Any congressional review? No. Any disclosure of the profile, the intelligence that justifies a finding, you're one of the terrorists we're going to vaporize? No. All secret. 
When this press conference was held two months ago, it had already become a well-established and undenied fact that the U.S., Britain, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and others were working directly with al-Qaeda networks to arm, fund, and facilitate the largely foreign rebel uprising in Syria, with the common aim of regime change, another gross violation of the Charter of the United Nations. This British-Saudi-U.S. relationship, however, wasn't news for many around the world, or for many here in the United States. Last month, EIR published a 130-page report called Obama's War on America, which provides a detailed mapping of Obama's complicity in the London-Saudi role in international terrorism, and the arc which connects the most recent attacks in Benghazi with the original 9-11 attacks in 2001. And this was covered up by Bush, and in his 2008 campaign, as Mr. LaRouche said, uh, Obama pledged to the families, the 9-11 families, that he would make that 28-page chapter publicly available and would investigate it further. He met with the families at the White House in February of 2009, right after he was inaugurated as president, and promptly after that shut the lid, refused to declassify those documents, and then have the Solicitor General go to court to make sure that no lawsuits against the Saudi government could be carried out in a U.S. court under a sovereign immunity deal, and it specifically shut down all of the civil actions that were probing at the Saudi and, by extension, British involvement through al Yamama in 9-11. There was a biography commissioned by Prince Bandar uh, back around 2009 in which he openly said, we created a joint covert operations fund between the British government and the Saudi government to finance black operations around the world, coup d'etats, operations like the 9-11 attack. And so all of these things are out there. We have footprints. We know the nature of the beast. We know the nature of the Anglo-Saudi arrangements in the specific al Yamama case. And so far, consecutively, the Bush and now Obama administrations have moved heaven and earth to cover up the evidence that exists that would open the door to getting to the bottom of it. I think it's the biggest cover-up since the Kennedy assassination. Unfortunately, however, this small, nonpartisan grouping demanding constitutional accountability and pushing war avoidance are neither in the White House or adequately represented in the U.S. Congress. Do the American people realize who they reelected? Did they realize that as early as 2009, Obama granted the same Saudi royal family that sponsored the original 9-11 hijackers and continue to sponsor international terrorism today diplomatic immunity to protect their role in the September 11th, 2001 attacks? Or how about the fact that what were once al-Qaeda prisoners of ours at Guantanamo Bay have since been freed, sent to Libya, and then became allies of Obama's illegal assault, overthrow, and murder of Libyan leader Gaddafi? This is the network that former Senator Bob Graham fatefully warned about on the anniversary of September 11th, the same day our consulate in Libya was attacked and Ambassador Stevens and three other U.S. personnel were killed. Graham asks, did the hijackers execute the plot alone? Or did they have the support of forces other than the known leaders of al-Qaeda? A network, even, that provided funds, assistance, and cover? It is not merely a question of the need to complete the historical record. It is a matter of national security today. If a support network was available to the terrorists before 9-11, why should we think it has now disbanded or been rolled up? It may still be in place, capable of supporting al-Qaeda or other extremist groups that hate America, of which there are many. So here we are 10 years into a series of wars that have drained our human, physical, and financial resources, based on a pretext that has been wholly discredited and has put the world as a whole in a position and order of magnitude more dangerous than when it first began. And by now, it ought to be obvious to any thinking American that the real target of the forces running the Obama administration is not eliminating terrorism. 
It is well known that this administration is actively supporting terrorism. The target here are the sovereign laws among nations. And so we ask the question again, do the American people realize what we have reelected? In this context, does it really matter what party you are? The single option left is for a bipartisan group of Americans to push for the political resolve which will avert our currently destined military engagement in the Middle East and beyond. Forget waiting four more years for to see if Obama changes course. Within 24 hours of his re-election, the push for Western military engagement in Syria went immediately into high gear, as British Prime Minister David Cameron wasted no time in saying that, with a newly elected American president, we have got to do more to help this part of the world, to help Syria achieve transition. Adding that now that the election is over, more must be done to shape the opposition and work with Al-Qaeda to topple the Syrian regime. There is an opportunity for Britain, for America, for Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and like-minded allies to come together and try to help shape the opposition outside Syria and inside Syria and try to help them achieve their goal, which is our goal, of a Syria without Assad. Shortly thereafter, France became the first Western nation to formally recognize the current Syrian opposition bloc as the sole representation for the Syrian people, which was then followed by the 27-member European Union's recognition of the opposition bloc on Monday. But a move that could rapidly and irreversibly plunge the entire planet into an unstoppable escalation towards world war was also announced on Monday, when it was reported that Turkey will soon submit a formal request that NATO place Patriot missiles along its Syrian border, effectively preparing for the establishment for a no-fly zone over Syria in the near future. This escalation compounded with the Israeli assault on Gaza, which is being reported as a preparation for a strike on Iran, ought to be cause for any thinking American, regardless of party affiliation, to carefully consider the implications of allowing Obama and the known network of London-Saudi-sponsored terrorism remain unchecked any longer.